We'd like to welcome each and every one of you, uh, those of you online as well as those of you in the sanctuary. We're glad you joined us today. Um, for those of you who are online, we, we had a, we already started, and you don't get to see that part of the video, but one of our one of our guys may have had a stroke, and, and so we had to pause the service. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to preach any shorter because I'm already short enough. So, uh, but we're going to have a, we're going to have a worship service with you, and we just want you to know that uh, be praying for a gentleman named Danny, and uh, he's on his way to the hospital. And uh, for, and I want you all to know out there online too, we pray for you. If we know what your requests and needs are, we spend time praying for you. And and our midweek prayer service, we have we pray, we're praying for revival at 8 p.m. and we always cover every request that we're aware of. So if you have requests, make sure they get to us. Uh, right now you can get me on uh, on either Facebook or YouTube. And uh, if you can't find me on Lisa at First Church of Nazarene on YouTube, they've started another account unless we get that straightened out. Right now if you find me under Michael Bittner, look for my face. That's the only way you'll know it's me because there are other Michael Bittners out there. All right. So you have your Bibles this morning. Amen. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says that I am. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. Boldly I confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible. The indestructible. The indescribable. The ever living seed of the word of the Lord. And I will never be the same. Amen. So if I, I'm going to hang a title on this, Beautiful Feet or Good News. John chapter 16, verse 33, the Bible says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then he said this, Jesus did, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. <laughs> I have overcome the world. And, and as District Assembly started out this week, the whole theme was take heart. Take heart. And Eddie started out, take heart. Because Jesus has overcome the world through trouble, turmoil, COVID, craziness, masks, whatever have, comes our way. Jesus has overcome the world. That's our promise. That we know. Aren't you glad? Amen. Amen. So, so I just thought, I thought I'd throw out Webster's Dictionary of a Foot. How many of y'all have feet? Amen. Most of us have two. Mm -hmm. Not always, because I've known a few folks who with diabetes have lost their feet. Um, but but it's, it's, in the lower, it's called the lower extremity of the leg that's in direct contact with the ground in standing or walking. Isn't that cool? And... Uh, for, for many of us, if you're over 50 especially, uh, your feet change. Now, I, I never had what I consider good-looking feet anyway, to start with. But I've broken up a few toes and ank both ankles, and so uh, I've modified how they could have looked, maybe. But I, I just thought, you know, so, so some of the words that come to mind, if you've ever walked into your kid's bedroom and smelled the socks, <laughs> smelly. Uh, some people call their feet hideous. Some would say ugly. But the Bible says beautiful in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Isn't that interesting? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Who proclaim peace. Who bring good tidings. Who proclaim salvation. Who say to Zion, your God reigns. Amen. I like that, don't you? See, it's not the looks of our feet as much as it is that they are used to bear the news. Romans chapter 10, verses 15, it says this, And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. That was my calling scripture. And I really answered God's call. I kind of knew I was supposed to preach all my life. Uh, but it was when I really understood that God had called me to be an emissary of the word. Well, what makes feet beautiful? Uh, so, there are some women, I'll tell you, there are some women that have such beautiful feet that they, that they make a good living getting their feet photographed with socks and shoes and hose and all that other stuff. 
and they have their toenails painted, and some of them, some of them ought to trim their toenails a little more. I've seen a few at Walmart. I'm just saying, hey, do something here. Uh, but, but the truth, of, as I said, it's not about the looks of someone's foot or their feet. Wouldn't it be sad if the hope of the world be in how our feet look? <laughs> I'm in trouble, okay? Okay. Uh, the, the, God called us to be emissaries. Now think about this. The condition of the world has been radically changed by sin. Adam and Eve. This is one of those amazing things. They were given everything they needed forever and ever and ever. And all they had to do was not eat of the tree. God said, that's the only one right there. Don't touch that one. You touch that one, you're surely going to die. I want you to understand this. So they didn't understand what death was. You know that? Because nobody ever died. They'd never seen anything die. They didn't quite get that. When the Satan came in and started to entice and talk to Eve, one of the things that bothered me, because I used to think, well, you know, maybe, maybe Adam was out there naming an animal or something. He was trying to figure out, how do you name a hippopotamus? Mm -hmm. And there's that giraffe. Have you ever thought about the giraffe? Have you ever thought about, what do they do when they get a sore throat? <laughs> things, that, things that I think about once in a while. Uh, so he's out there, and I always thought maybe he was out naming animals or trying to figure out what to do with this one or that one. And, 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 the, and the truth of the matter was, he, the Bible said he was there with Eve when the serpent beguiled her. Mama. Understand this, he was her helpmate. Mm -hmm. And his job was to protect her with his life. Mm -hmm. And when man sinned, because we always blame Eve, she ate the fruit. Excuse me, he ate the fruit too. Okay. He was right All there right. with her. Mm -hmm. He didn't go, excuse me, hon, don't do that. Remember what God said? He should have been cheering it on and That's saying, no, right. no, no. Right. But he didn't. And Eve ate of the fruit and handed it off. And, and so today we have a broken world because man sinned. Somebody said, well, what happened if Adam and Eve had never sinned? Their children would have. As long as we have free choice. Someone's going to break the rules. Amen? Amen? The Bible says this in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will, say, will be saved. And how then shall they call on the one, who, the one they have not believed in? And how should they believe in the one of who they have not heard? And how should they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? That's my passage that called me to preach right there. For it's written, as I mentioned earlier, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news or bring the good news. I, I, I've shared this story with you. I know I've shared this with you before. I think it's worthy of, of again, because I have, I have a friend who's Salvation Army, and Debbie and Raleigh McClure, who, who uh, Debbie was one of our associates, was, was of this, the uh, Salvation Army as well. General William Booth, you've heard of him, haven't you? He's the founder of the Salvation Army. And uh, because of him, millions are fed and millions are helped, and the gospel is preached and a shelter given to them. Booth proclaimed a heart to God and a hand to man. Did you know there was a cousin of Booth? Did you know that? He had a cousin. You know what his name was? First cousin, John Wilkes Booth. Oh, wow. Who took the president's life. One cousin blessed a nation and continues to bless it because of his life, and the other had a curse on him for the rest of his life. So get this. The gospel does make a vast difference. What is it about the gospel? What's the good news? What's the good news? That we can have life eternal and that God will bridge the gap between sin and hell in us. That's awesome. Without the truth of the gospel, the world is lost. There is no hope. And I've thought about this, and we've talked about this before, but if Jesus Christ had not defeated death, hell, and the grave, and raised himself on the third day and kicked the door open, we'd have no reason to have church today. There'd be no, there'd be no reason. 
We'd go through the motions of whatever. We'd live and die. And hell would be our destiny because we've sinned against God. But God provided Jesus to take our place on the cross. Amen. Because of the good news, we as individuals can have an impact on other people's lives. And so I want to talk about the good news a little bit. First of all, what is the good news? Who should tell the good news? And why should it be told? And how do we do it? The problem today is we've got the good news but we're so busy, sometimes we don't tell the story. So what makes the news so good? I, I had somebody say, you know, I don't hear anybody preaching on hell. I'm going to talk to you about it a little bit, I think, this morning. Anything? I think about it. First of all, when you think of the good news, what comes to mind? Here's, here's one of the good news. A call from the family member that you haven't heard from in a long time. Loretta Nelson, she's in her 90s. She's one of my dad's nieces. And, and, and she called to tell me. Now, she didn't give me good news, okay? She gave me news of a number of family members that had passed away, but I hadn't talked to her in three years. Wow. And she was on her way to a funeral in Elgin, Nebraska. She lives in California, that foreign country over there. <laughs> and she was on her way. It, it was good to hear from her. Amen. Uh, here's another one. You were diagnosed with... In, 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 an inoperable cancer and found out that the cancer diagnosis was a mistake. Wow. Oh, Lord Jesus. One, 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 some years ago, before Judy and I got married, I broke my ankle. I mean, I broke my broke my ankle. Broke every major bone you could break off in the ankle, and I'm in my hospital room, and uh, I've got a temporary thing, and, uh, and uh, I take it back. It was the surgery. I had a hernia surgery what, when, when this one happened. And I'm laying there in the bed with the hernia surgery. And, and the morning I was to be sprung from there. 5.30 in the morning, this lady came in and said, Mr. Smith? And I said, no. She said, Mr. Smith, it's time to get you out of here for your surgery. And I said, oh, no. Oh, my gosh. She was going to take me. I, I, and I never did meet Mr. Smith. And I don't know what they were going to do to him, but they didn't want to do that to me. I said, I already gave. <laughs> Misdiagnosis. Um, I have to tell you that I was very thankful they didn't drag me down the hallway. Uh, how about this one? Your boss calls, brings you into their office, and says, instead of firing you, you're getting a great raise and an extra week's salary. That'd be a good one, wouldn't it? How about this one? This is for you who have parents or grandkids. You're, you're a parent, you have a child or a grandchild, and you find out your grandchild is gritty straight A's. Wow, wow. Yeah. How about this one? You're getting an unbelievable refund from the IRS. Oh, wow. Mm. How about this one? One of your favorite TV shows. Because I hear about this, this thing called binge watching. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and your favorite TV show or your favorite movie series is going to be on, like Star Wars or one of those kind of things. And it's going to be on and on and on. You can sit and watch the whole thing and you don't have to go to work for a week. How about this one? You have just won a, a, a free chance to jump out of a perfectly good airplane skydiving. Uh -uh. Amen. I told somebody the other day, because I'm on an airplane, I think, when we flew to see uh, Ken and, and Glenda, we flew to Augusta, Georgia. They put us on a, on a jet plane so small, the pilot left his door open. Oh, oh Lord Jesus. And, I, and we had two engines on the jet. And I said to Judy, I said, you know why that door is open, don't you? Because if that engine goes out, it can holler, hang on. Ah. That's the smallest, smallest jet I've ever flown. Oh, no. Sky damage out. How about this one? Uh, Kansas City Chiefs are playing in the Super Bowl, and they have given you free tickets in the clubhouse suite. Wow. Now, this one, you'll never, it will never happen to you in a million years, no matter how many magazines you buy. But how about this? You just won the publisher's sweepstake, and you get $5,000 a week for the rest of your life. Now, Bubba, if you're a car guy, how about this one? You've just been nominated to overhauling, and your car is being taken to California to get be built by none other than Chip Foos, and they're also taking your wife's car, too, if you want to get it. Amen. That'd be cool. 
But, but, but the whole thing is that the most important news ever is not something that happens to us or that we hope that happens to us. The odds are every one I named off is not going to happen. You know that, right? Amen. But it's simply this, that Jesus Christ is alive today. He is crucified, kicked the grave open. He lives today, and he guides us. Paul's dedicated preaching was this. Here's his truth. When I came to you, brothers, I didn't come with eloquence or superior wisdom. I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except this, Jesus and him, Christ and Him crucified. Don't you like that? What, what we need to proclaim to the world today, to our friends, to our family members is that He lives in our hearts and He changed us completely. And when we were lost and undone and headed to a devil's hell, He said, Stop! I've got this. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 2,000 years ago, I, the, the question's been asked, and, there, and especially those who don't know Christ, what could be good about a guy who died 2,000 years ago and was executed? Well, for me, it means my salvation. It means the salvation of the entire world of those who will listen, those who will believe, and those who will receive. His pain was our gain. Christ appeared to be an ordinary man, but he was God in the flesh. He was an extraordinary Savior, and he saw our need. And before he went to the cross, he had a plan. And if you remember, the Bible said he set his face to Jerusalem knowing that he was going to find joy. I'm giving you Mike's translation doing the will of the Father in heaven. So Paul writes the church at Philippi in chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. He said, And being found in the appearance of man, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, and that the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Christ deserves the title not because of his suffering, but because he was and is and forever will be God. Part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says this, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. Amen. He died for us. Christ identified to be Jesus. Identified to be Messiah. Jesus said, who do the people say that I am? You remember that story? I preached on that recently. Who do they say I am? And they came up with all these names. And Peter said, oh no, you're the Messiah. You're the one. You're the one. You know what Jesus said? This isn't because you were observant. This is because the Holy Spirit gave it to you. The prophet spoke about it. Isaiah 53. I love Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions. 53 verse 5. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now sometimes we talk about physical healing here. I'm not saying that doesn't work. But I'm talking about our spiritual wounds, the spiritual destruction. God sent his son, and by the wounds he received, we have spiritual healing, and we're made one again with God. That restoration, the chasm between Adam and Eve and, and, and heaven, that was broken. And Jesus put himself in that place to bridge the gap for us. That's a hallelujah. Christ himself. Jesus said this, I and the Father are one. John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word what? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Don't you like that? Amen. And then there's his disciples who told about it. Matthew 16, 15 and 16. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? I just mentioned this one. Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Don't you? I, I, I wish. I mean, if ever, ever you do time travel, wouldn't it be cool to go back and we'd be standing there with Peter and, and, and the rest of the disciples and Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And we're going, hey, I know. I know. I'm from the future. I can tell you. And he's not going to see us. You know that. But we listen to Peter as he says, you're the son of the living God. You are the one. Whew. So, how about, even, I mean, the Bible, here's a, here's a guy named, you remember Saul of Tarsus? Amen. He was a blight to the church, the new church. He was. He cost people their lives. The Bible says this in Acts 9.22. 
Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews by living in Damascus and proving that Jesus is the Christ. This is Paul who, who led a, a, an entourage and, and, and on the way, he meets Jesus. Can I tell you something? When you meet Jesus, you can never be the same again. And the Bible says, yeah. the bright light came, he falls off his horse, his face down, and, and this is my story, okay? In my imagination, he falls face down in the sand, and he's laying there, and all the other guys are going, what happened to him? He's laying in the sand there, and, 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 and maybe they saw the light, maybe they didn't, I don't know. It, it never says, the scripture never said what happened to the rest of the guys that he was with. Jesus gave him instructions where to go, who to see. But, but, but the bright light is there, and, 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 and the question is asked of Saul. He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I, I hope the rest of those guys got to hear that, right? Amen. Because they're on the way to persecute Christians. All Saul says is, who are you, Lord? It didn't take a brain surgeon to figure out. He was, he was dealing with something bigger than him. Now, this is Saul... Who's a, who's a theologian, who has a multitude of languages, speaks four or five languages, has got every degree you can get education-wise, and he's laying on the ground face down, and he hears a voice that says, why do you persecute me? And he says, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. Wow. I want you to get this. Never again could he go back to before. From that day forth, he said, I live to gain Christ. I want to gain him in life. I want to gain him in death. I want to gain him in the resurrection. Why? Because he had met the Jesus who could radically transform his life. Wow. Wow. So Saul grew powerful. And so after, the, after he gets saved, he has to go meet a guy who knows he's the enemy. <laughs> Well, think about this. This is the worst guy in the, in, 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 uh, of all the Jews because he's taken on an entourage to destroy the new Christian church. And all of a sudden he knocks on the door. Hi there, I'm Saul of Tarsus. God told me to come and see you. And the guy goes, hey, you're not going to believe who's at the door. It's that guy that kills everybody. Don't answer it. Right? I mean, can you imagine? This is the enemy number one. And he's knocking on the door, let me in. I found Jesus. Mm -hmm. How awesome. And, and so Jesus comes in. I mean, uh, so Paul, Saul comes in. And, and by the way, Jesus changed his name from Saul to Paul. Amen. We don't hear him, Paul of Tarsus, anymore. No. We're really just Paul. Mm -hmm. An apostle. By unnatural birth. <laughs> he wasn't called by Jesus with the rest of the disciples. But that day on the road to Damascus there, Jesus made him a part of the team. And he included him. And from that day to the day his head was taken off, Saul, Paul, served Jesus of Nazareth and gave more than he did before. I like that, don't you? In the place of our sin, Jesus took our place. I like that. He died for us. And, and as you and me. And I thought about this too because when Jesus said, he talked about us in the future. Isn't that cool? Yes. He didn't see us. My yes, he did. Lord. But when he would talk about not only now but in the future, he knew that someday we would be a part of that. And he knew who we were because he's omnipotent God as well as omnipresent. So what's so sad is that it's a simple thing. We have to lay claim to the fact that Jesus is Lord. We have to lay claim to the fact and get the message out that Jesus can save you from your sin. That he can take your sins from you. That they'll be held against you and condemnation will not be against you when you die. And here's the thing. Most people think they're going to escape death. There are people at John Knox that live way longer than they should because they got money. <laughs> I'm just saying. Right. They should have died. Patch him up. He's got money. <laughs> I want to be patched okay, up until I'm till God's done with you. You know what I'm saying? What's wrong with him? I don't know. Make it. Make something new. And get, he's got a lot of money, man. So, so it's, you understand. By, by the grace of God, we have the gift of God. Amen? Amen. 
Listen, we are aliens, but God gave us the gift. We deserve the worst. He gives us his best. And like Jacob, we have a new birthright, righteously received, because Jesus took our place. I like that, don't you? That's what you call the good news. That's the good news. Who should tell the good news? Who should tell the good news? Who do we tell? Have you thought about this? Think about this. That in less than a generation in America, the gospel of Jesus Christ could become history. Look at all the communist bloc countries. Look at China. The only reason the church there is thriving is because it's gone underground. If you know, if they know you're a Christian, you're done. Because they will take your life. Uh, my friend in Iran, if they knew that he loved the United States, they would kill him. Isn't that sad? And so, who, I thought about this too. Um, how many of you, have you ever, have anyone in here ever sold cars? Sold cars. Because here's, I'll tell you what, the only way you can see, my friend Jerry Childs used to drive a demonstrator, all right? Because we'd go four wheeler and he'd get a Toyota Land Cruiser, and I had one. And, uh, he, 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 the salesman drives the car. I've got a friend over at least some at Dodge that drives the Hellcats and all that stuff. You know why he does that? So you can tell you how good they are. He sold on it. You'll never have a salesman who doesn't like the product he sells. And if it is, he's not going to be successful. But I'll tell you what, if the guy likes what he's got, he's going to tell you how good it is. I want to tell you about my Dodge Durango SRT. You step on a throttle, it snarls. I can tell you about my Dodge Diesel pickup truck that I just picked up from Arizona. It, ra it is so bad. It rattles so cool. If you like diesel trucks, I like diesel trucks. This thing snorts and, and, and snarls, and, and, and you run it through the gears. You have to start in second gear because low gear is way too low. You can get about three feet, and you have to shift gears. But I'm going to tell you how great that thing is. It's a 12 valve diesel with a 5 speed transmission. And the fifth speed is overdrive. Ah, so cool. If you're a car guy, if you're not, you're going, what's he talking to, man? I like custom cars. So I have a 52 Plymouth with a, with a 78 Camaro front subframe and a 75 Cadillac motor and, and a transmission. All this stuff is used, all the parts I put in this car are used parts, some reconditioned. Isn't that cool? Because after all, I'm used. Quite used completely. I like that stuff. And, 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 and so, so if we're going to be good Christians serving God, we've got to look at what we've got and why we should proclaim. First John chapter 1, verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. I've thought about this. Those disciples, all the story they had was what they had experienced walking with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Talking with Jesus. What... what cemented it for them, what gave them the power to stand up knew, when they knew their life was going to be taken for telling the story was they had experienced an empty tomb. They knew that Jesus just wasn't saying he was going to come back. They saw him. Hundreds of people saw him. And, and, and so we proclaim to you in our fellowship with the Father and, and his Son, Jesus Christ, we have fellowship. That's what John would write. And, and, and so it's our responsibility. You know what Jesus said? He said, here's what he said. I like this. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he said this, therefore go make disciples of how many nations? All, na all nations. Then he said, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then he said, and surely, listen to me, and surely... I'm with you always. How long? Even to the end. Now, I'm not going to tell you that we're in the end of the age, but we may be from the looks of things. Amen? Do you, do you remember when Princess Diana died? It was August 31st, um, 1997. The reason I say that, that's been a while, right? The world was rocked by this princess that was killed in this car wreck. A lot of speculation on how she died. And they're still talking about it. The other day, the other day, the two boys had gone back to England, and there was speculation of how Mama died. They were still talking about it. And I thought, the sad thing is this, that there's more dedication to...
to a, a dethroned, passed away, dead princess than Jesus of Nazareth in our nation today. Amen. Isn't that tragic? So why should, we, why should we tell this? Well, I'll tell you something. There are billions of people that are not going to get to heaven unless we tell the story. Amen. Amen. I heard about this guy. Uh, Chris, Chris and, and Kelly. Kelly had his four-wheel drive Toyota truck, and Chris had this giant Jeep with 37-inch Jeep tires. And we went four-wheeler. If you look on my page, you'll see the water we went through and all that stuff. And, and as we went there, we we got to the, we thought the road would go up around the mountain and come back down. No, no, it dead ended at a cemetery. Oh wow! The 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 newest. I mean, there there was somebody buried there in 1901, but most of them were 1800 and something. Wow! All right? It was crazy. And, and I thought, you know, so so this this was quite appropriate because this guy was researching his family. He said, "Pause now, strangers, you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. I." As I am now, so soon you'll be. Prepare yourself to follow me. Someone wrote in, in, in chalk or something on it, to follow you I'm not content until I know which way you went. Two destinies. Two destinies, folks. Heaven or hell. That's it. The Bible says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. God is the road that leads to destruction. Many enter through it, but the small gate is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Two gates, one wide, one small. Two roads, one broad, one narrow. Two destinies, one destination. One is life and one is death, spiritually. C.S. Lewis, this great writer who did uh, the screw tape letters and a lot of those others, he said there's no doctrine I'd be more willing to remove from Christianity than this one. For if it lay in my power to do so, I'd pay any price to say all men may be saved. But he said, I can't say that. No one can say that. Because the Bible says, unfortunately, people are going to die and go to hell. How do we get to heaven? How do we get out of this? By confessing Christ as Lord and accepting Him as Savior and letting Him forgive us of our sin and turning away. The Bible says, repent, get away from the sin. That's my translation. And there are a lot of people, folks, I want to get this. I, I heard about this lady who was sitting by a swim pool. And you know those round things, uh, life preserver things, you know, they're sitting there with the long pole. And she said she was just sitting there lounging away in the sunlight. Said there was a guy out in the pool in the middle, and he was floundering. And he was going to drown. Mm. And the question is, do we do something about that person in the pool drowning, or do we sit there and go, good luck? I see that right. hand. Is there another? Yeah. Well, human nature says the first thing we're going to do is jump up, just like we called 911 for, for, uh, for Danny. Mm -hmm. We jump up Amen. and we throw out a life preserver and, and get them help and bring them in. Mm -hmm. The problem is this. The church of Jesus Christ sits and watches people perish. We are so busy. We're so afraid to tell the story. I have to tell you again, what made the disciples so effective was this, that, that they told what they had experienced and what they'd seen. That's all they did. We've seen Jesus. We've walked with him. He's walked with us. He's changed our lives. He lives today because we saw him after the grave. We touched him. He touched us. See, the story is this, that, that our society today, you think about the cartoons. It has taken the scariness out of hell. It's made it into a cartoon. Remember Hot Stuff? The cute little, cute little Casper the Ghost. There was a Hot Stuff. Had little horns. Had a little pitchfork and a cute little fork tail. I've read the scriptures. It doesn't talk about hell like that. Hell a place of eternal punishment. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, a place called Gehenna. And it's a Greek, Greek worm word for uh, a belly of Hinnom. And uh, it, it's a place called South of Jerusalem. And, and what, God, what Jesus was doing was, was talking about this. This is a place in, the, in this valley. The Canaanites worship Baal, the fire god, and very often sacrifice. Can you imagine sacrificing your children? They sacrificed their children in the fire that burned continuously and never went out. And in Jesus' time, this valley of Hinnom was used as a garbage dump for Jerusalem. 
And so they threw all the filth in, in, in and sometimes even the bodies of animals and, and executed criminals they tossed in there. And it was a bad place. And, and, and so the fires burned continually. And the winds blew from that direction and the awfulness of the smell of it was evident. At night, wild dogs would gnash their teeth and, and they'd fight over the garbage. And, 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 and so the question in, in, in Nelson's Bible Dictionary, Jesus said, used this scene as a symbol of hell. Basically what he said is, you want to know what hell is like? Look at the bell of Gehenna. The worm doesn't die. By the way, if you've ever read the Je Jehovah's Witness, uh, uh, don't believe that there's a there's a hell forever. They believe that that if you don't make it, you're gone and that's it. But I read their Bible and it says this: it says where the worm dies not. And that's that's from Mark chapter nine, verse forty-eight. I believe it is. Anyway, Jesus spoke of outer darkness. He spoke of the furnace and a fire. Where, where there's no quenching of the fire. And I was thinking about the rich man and Lazarus. The Bible says rich man gave Lazarus the crumbs from his table, but then they both died. And in hell he looked up. And he saw the rich man in Abraham's bosom. And he said, hey, could you send him to bring me, listen to me, a drop of water to cool my tongue? That's torment. And, and, and so, 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 and of course, he was told, "No, there's not." And by the way, he also was told this. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago because it really struck me. Bring somebody to help me. Then let me go tell my family. And you know what he was told? They have their prophets. Our job, folks, is to tell the story. Our job is to is to help them not to be tormented forever and ever and ever. Revelation. Chapter 20, verse 10 says, it'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's scary. And, 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 and so how do we tell the story? Well, first of all, Romans chapter 10, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through how? The word of the Lord. John chapter 6, verse 47, I tell you the truth, he who believes in everlasting life has, ever, has it. Who, who believes in Jesus, he who believes has everlasting life. Here's another one in Luke 13, 3. I tell you, no, unless you repent, you'll perish. 1 John 1, 9. We, we memorize this one. If we confess our sins, what is he? Faithful and just to forgive our sin and to purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Peter said in Acts, when he's preaching that great message, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will do what? Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't you like that? Amen. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's scary. John 3, 3, Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Amen. So secondly, when we receive the good news, when we find Jesus our Savior, we want to share it with others. We need to share it. We're commanded to share it. And of course, I read that scripture this morning. How should they call on the one who they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them or telling them the story? And I want to tell you something. As laymen, sometimes it's not your job to be the preacher. You just tell them what happened to you. You're not going to believe this. I was a sinner. I was undone. I was miserable. And God came into my life and gave me a reason to be. That's why I'm here today. And I'm telling you because I want you to have what I got. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. It's because... Of the imminence, imis, we're bringing it to them. Can't say the word this morning. We're emissaries. So, so it's not the beautiful feet. It's the fact that they carry us to do the job of God. Amen. 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 Right. One of Judy's favorite stories, and I'm going to share it with you this morning. But there was an old man walking down a beach, early, early morning before the people got out. You may have used this too. An old man was walking along ahead of him. He said he'd pick up a starfish and throw it in the water. Going a little further, there's another starfish in the sand. Pick it up and throw it a little further. And, and, and the guy following him says, what are you doing? And he said, oh, he said, these starfish get stranded. If I don't get them in the water, they're going to die. And, and he said, the guy says, but the beach goes on for miles and miles. And there are millions of starfish. How, how can your effort make a difference? He said, it made a difference to the one I just threw back in the water. Our job, folks, is to make a difference to those who are flattering. You see, telling our story is not an option. That's what I want you to get. It's not an option. If we're going to grow the church, if we're going to build the kingdom, it's because we told the story. 
How do you bring people to church? First of all, you've got to help them find the Savior that you found. Amen. Sometimes it's better to get them saved outside before you bring them inside. Amen? Mm -hmm. You remember the woman at the well? Mm -hmm. Yes. She brings her water pots there. And Jesus meets her there and says, Woman, give me a drink. He sent his disciples. I thought about this too. I thought about this. He sent his disciples away. This was between her and him. They would look down on her, as society did. She came at the heat of the day because she was a woman who had lived with a number of different men, and she had a bad reputation. And she went when no one else would make fun of her or bother her. And when Jesus said, give me the drink, he knew that he didn't have a dipper. And she knew. And she asked him about that. And he said, woman, if you knew who I was, I could give you water that if you drink of that, you'd never thirst again. And then he told her about her life. You know what happened? The Bible says she ran back to town, left her water pots, which are so expensive. And she said this, come and see a man who told all about me. Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble. Take heart. I have overcome. Amen. I want you to stand with me. I thought about this. And, and, and Eddie, Eddie shared that passage of scripture. And it reminded me that Jesus overcame. I don't care how bad it is. You know how it is. There's, there's some ucky stuff in our life, right? There's stuff that isn't happy. It's not pleasant. Uh, Phyllis's daddy's in the hospital with with, with a, a, a fluid and all this stuff, and he needs a pacemaker, and, and it's scary times. But I want to tell you something. God said, take heart. I have overcome. Our job then is to take the story and to share it, because we know our Savior, our Redeemer lives, and He's an overcomer, and He's beat the odds. And he's, he's on our side. And so I'm going to just close out today. And I want you to stand with me if you would. We're just going to pray. We're just going to say, Lord, help us. We know so many people out there who will not make it to heaven unless you help us. Give us a passion. Give us a burden. Wake up in the middle of the night. Wake us up if we need be. Instead of trying to get back to sleep, just say, Lord, I'll pray till you put me to sleep. I'll guarantee you it'll come fast. So let's pray. Father, we bow before you. We thank you, Lord, that when we were lost and undone, you provided a way, and we ask you to forgive us. Reminded that song like a woman at the well, I was thirsty. And for today, Lord, we would ask you to fill us, fill our cup. Refresh our hearts and souls. Give us a reason to tell the story. Give us excitement and enthusiasm. We think of Danny as they took him into the hospital. He may be having a stroke. We pray in the name of Jesus you would touch him. Yes, Lord. Yeah. We don't know what the plan is. We don't know uh, how you're going to restore him or how you're going to touch him. But we pray in Jesus' name you would touch him. We pray, Lord, for each one in here that you would stir our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be messengers. Yes, Lord Jesus. Help us to take it seriously, Lord. Forgive us for not doing good enough. And Lord, fill our hearts with joy. Give us what Paul got, enough that we can be totally focused on serving you and telling the story. So be careful to give you praise in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. 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 May God bless you. May he fill you with his presence. May he rain down on you with joy and peace. Go with God, I love you. We'll see you next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. God bless you.